Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. This video is going to be uh, <coughs> kind of different because this one was actually filmed in August of me prepping a new location, which is something I don't think I had done in the previous 10 years because uh, I do everything in postseason and have everything prepped typically by the end of April. Uh, before green up so this one was done during the full foliage of summer and it was basically i went in to look at a spot because i had a tree fall in the tree i normally saddle hunted from and when i went in to take that tree out because it fell right where i sit the property owner had told me this was on private property and the farmer had been in there looking around and a big tree had fell right where I actually hunt from my saddle. So I had to go in there and cut this huge tree out and block it up, ch chop it up, uh, to, and then put in some more steps because it bent some of the steps when it did that. And while I was there, I noticed that the apple tree, that that tree was prepared to hunt, did not have any apples in it. But there was another tree probably 10 yards, 15 yards away from it, that was loaded with apples. So I had never prepped a tree to hunt that other apple tree. And you couldn't shoot to that other apple tree from the tree that the big oak fell into, uh, where it fell into my saddle, other saddle tree that I typically hunted. So uh, I've got my gear. I have a, a steel extension chainsaw, and I went back in. Uh, during August, I think it was, uh, I don't know, early 10th of August, maybe somewhere in there. And I prepared the location and it was at a spot where this cattail marsh slash marsh grass swamp butted right up, right up to the backside of this apple tree. And you'll, I show that in the video. Uh, so I had to pretty much rape that apple tree which I've shown videos doing that before because the red oak that I had no option, I had to hunt from this red oak. And from the red oak, I couldn't get a shot to the backside of that apple tree. So I had to rape the front of that apple tree and it had a lot of autumn olive and just brush underneath it because it typically had never had apples before. So the deer didn't keep everything worn down. So it was, uh, I had to cut all the brush out and move it, and I ended up taking off my shirt. It was so hot, I was sweaty. Cut myself, cut my arms all up, and uh, then I had to prep the tree as well. So I, I show cutting all the stuff up and moving it, blocking a runway. Uh, then I show prepping the actual tree, uh, the red oak that I'm going to be hunting from. And then I went back. I, I actually hunted that tree one time, and I didn't see anything that fall. Um, Basically, there wasn't any shooter bucks on that property at all because the other guys that hunted as well, it was a free permission property. Uh, they had cameras out and they, had, they didn't have a picture of anything over, I think, 85 inch, you know, a two year old 14 inch eight point. So, um, so I only hunted that tree one time, but then I went back in the spring to actually video showing me physically in the tree, maneuvering around the tree for shots because I did not do that the day that I prepped it because I had my prep gear so I didn't have my saddle so I went back with my saddle once the foliage was down in this in you know post season and I videoed moving around the tree and then I videoed also some stuff on my ESS but it's very interesting and I want you to please make a note on this when I prepped this tree it would have been very easy for me to prep much lower in that red oak than what I did because there was lots of foliage in the tree. So I had, didn't matter where I would have been in that red oak, I would have had plenty of background cover as long as there was foliage in the tree. But because this was at a food location, a destination food location, it was an early season location as well as a rut phase location. So if I would have prepped that lower in that red oak, I would have had ample background cover for getting away with some movements in early season when the foliage was in the tree. But by 1st of November, you know, get into pre-rut, late October, early November, um, that I would have been way too low. I would have gotten picked if there were multiple deer because that is a feeding destination location, you know, and if there's three or four or five deer come in there and eat apples for a 20 minute period and they're looking around while they're eating, 
odds are really good I would have gotten picked because I was so low. Even though I would have been on the other side of the tree, being that low is not conducive to get a shot opportunity because it, when you take your shot, you do have to move around to the side of the tree to take that shot with a saddle. So there is some movements involved. So I prepped the tree high knowing this. I've been doing this for 50 some years. So I knew that this was going to be a rut location as well as an early season feeding location. So I prepped it really high. I'm probably up there pushing 27, 28 feet to my feet. But if you notice, when I go back and you're looking at me moving around the tree in the saddle, showing my shooting lanes that I had made the previous summer, uh, it's going to look a lot different. I'm going to be totally exposed up there. But when he pans back, you know, my grandson filmed that and he's really young. So it's pretty shaky, uh, that part of it anyway. Uh, so when I pan back, he pans back showing me up the tree from the base all the way up to the top. You'll see how high I am. So when you're up that high, you can get away with quite a lot of movements because you're up above their peripheral vision. So it's really important to note that and to notice the difference in how I looked up in that tree while I was prepping it with the background foliage and once I was up there and prepping the final stages up at the top versus when I was physically up in the tree and all the foliage is gone. All you got is a sky background. So major difference in any time you're prepping a location that you're going to be hunting during the rut. Always keep that in mind. Make sure you prep it higher than normal especially if you're prepping it when there's foliage on the trees. Because when you go back there during the run, the foliage is gone. If you don't prep it high enough, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb and your odds of getting picked go up. Everything should run on percentages. What is your best percentage odds of getting a shot opportunity? And your best percentage odds of getting a shot opportunity is when you're up high enough where you're out of their peripheral vision. So keep that in mind. I swept my butt off in this video because uh, I don't usually do this stuff in the summer, but uh, it's going to be interesting and I, I hope you enjoy it. I wish I'd have brought my gloves, I could help you out there. 
Oh, I got some gloves. Up in that backpack. Yeah, that autumn olive, that didn't start showing up until about, I don't know, 1980s or so? Yeah, yeah that's, that sounds about right. The public land I hunted, didn't have any, and then 20 years later, solid. <laughs> This is a new location and it's pretty rare I ever prep anything this time of year when the greenery's up and uh, it's basically early early August. I have all my stuff done typically by the end of April, but once in a blue moon I do prep a new location because it's something that's uh, something that I found. Because I was back in here, a big tree fell into one of my other trees. So uh, I had to come in here, it was a big red oak and cut that tree up. I was gonna film it, but I forgot because uh, it was leaning right where I sit with my saddle. And the tree that I hunt, saddle hunt out of is like a probably a 24 inch diameter red oak and it fell right into the exact spot where I, where I hang. And I walked around a little bit and uh, a couple of the trees didn't have apples this year. So I found this one. I didn't really find this. I knew it was here, but it was never a spot I had to prep before. And it requires a lot of work. Um, as you can see with the saw, I had to rape this side of the tree. I'm going to be sitting in that. There's a big red oak over there. I've got to cut that birch tree down. I've got to cut down a part of an a, a crab apple tree that's blocking this tree. But uh, this tree has apples in it this year. And you've got to make sure anytime you're prepping an apple tree in this particular property, it's the only property I've got that has apple trees on it. And it has quite a few because this all used to be pasture uh, back in the, I think in the, 40s and 50s and uh, anytime you're prepping an apple tree you have to make 100% certain that you have a shot to the back side of the tree so from that tree you know there's there's been deer here already there was clumped up deer droppings all around here around this perimeter basically it was under branches wasn't licking branches mind you but it was under branches that were hanging low enough where deer were standing up on their feet and eating apples off the, off the branches so i took all those branches off and put them in a pile over there and I, I actually with those branches i blocked a runway that i didn't want deer coming down because the other runway they come through that autumn olive through i actually have a clear shot from my uh, the red oak so i blocked that other runway off with a pile of junk, but I opened up the side of the tree and also I opened it up where I can actually get a shot to this side of the tree. You know, if I hadn't touched this apple tree, the only shot I would have had would have been right here. I wouldn't have had a shot there. I wouldn't have had a shot there because it was a big branches hanging down here that would have blocked their body, body cavity. So whenever you're uh, prepping a location at a you know, at a, at a primary scrape area, any kind of destination area, white oak, red oak, beech tree, a persimmon tree in the south, you wanna make sure you've got a shot to the back side of the tree. Cause this tree here, as you can tell, it's got a lot of brush. There's a swamp down there. This is right up on the edge of the swamp. I mean, it's literally 20 yards to the swamp and the cattails down there. So they can come right up out of here, come up through this autumn olive, and eat apples all the way around this tree, depending on where they're dropping, you know, because uh, typically apples are a first come, first serve. So 
you know, one day there may be a few apples over here, the next day there may be a few apples over here. Well, I'm not hunting here every damn day, so I can't tell what's going to happen. So I've got to have a shot to all of them, no matter where the apples drop. And the way I'm prepping this tree, I'm going to have that. But I still have to cut that birch tree down, most of it anyway, and, and probably half of a crab apple tree that's still, it's kind of in the way. And I will uh, film me prepping that tree. Uh, that's going to be prepped with uh, screw-in steps. Uh, again, this is private property. You can't prep stuff really on public. Uh, during season, I will have some videos on me going in and prepping some trees and leaving the stuff in the tree. Uh, but obviously, on public, I'm not. In Michigan, you don't leave sticks and steps and stuff in trees in Michigan because it'll just be gone when you go back, and you definitely don't use cameras. Uh, so I'm actually going to put a camera here, which is really rare. I don't think I've used a camera in Michigan in since 2014. So uh, this is just a spot because of all this clumped up uh, droppings. I kind of want to see what's coming in here because last year I hunted here and there was not a, I don't think there was a buck here over 100 inches last year. Uh, the other two guys hunting this property never saw anything over 100 inches and they live right here. So they hunted it a lot. I'm 40 minutes from here. I didn't hunt it that much. Um, but uh, I have shot a couple couple good bucks off this property over 125. Um, so we'll see what happens this year. So because nobody shot any of those two and a half year old 85, 90 inches, you know, maybe maybe they'll grow that big. I doubt it, but you never know. So we'll see what happens and I'll keep filming the rest of this, cutting down that uh, birch tree and prepping the red oak. I'm going to get up there pretty high up in that oak. And as you can see, this is the direction I have to shoot. So a lot of that birch, at least this one side, has to come out so that I can take this shot in this direction because it's right in the way, as does some of that crab apple tree right there. Some of those upper branches are definitely in the way as well. But initially, you always, what you always want to do is prep your location on the ground first, clear your shooting lanes, clear whatever you have to do on the ground for your shots that you need, then you prep the tree, and then once you're up in the tree and you got your location prepped, then you look around and make sure you didn't miss anything while you were clearing the lanes because most often when you're clearing shooting lanes, most people what they do is they'll prep the tree and then they'll go down and clear the lanes and then they get back up in the tree during hunting season because they don't go back up and look and there's stuff that they missed. So by clearing the lanes first, clearing out the ground underneath the tree, prepping the tree, basically what that does is once you get up, prep your location, you can look down your lanes and if there's anything you missed when you get back down, you can clean those up. That way you're 100% guaranteed when you come back, shooting lanes are going to be clear. And I always like to clear my shooting lanes wide enough so that one or one year of new growth won't affect it. I like to do it where only every other year I have to go in and and clean them up a little bit. Some trees, because it's autumn olive, some of the trees, shooting lanes are in autumn olive, which grows super fast. Um, I have to go back every year, but uh, typically, if it's not through autumn olive, it's an every two year reprep. Okay, I got that cut down. The chips happened to fall right in my face. So I had to close my eyes, but got that stuff cut down. 
cleared out the base, so uh, next thing I'm going to do is prep the tree. So I'll try and video most of that. I may go to lunch first because I didn't eat breakfast. And this heat's getting to me. It's over 80 degrees right now. And it's in the sun. Being in the sun, 80 degrees, working like this, takes it out of an old man like me. So I'll come back and film prepping the tree. The water leaks around the, the, the coupling. Gotcha. They really draw it through that pipe. This one lower branch here, you could leave that, couldn't you? What did you say those guys, uh, they were, the, that were here the other day, they were from Ohio? Yeah, they were from Ohio. Got it?
Okay, I'm up in that oak. This is one of my shooting lanes right here. So I've got this as a wide open, wide open shot. I cleared some branches. And then I'm going to have John move over to this other spot over here where I've got another shot. Okay, now John's in a different spot. So real easy to take that shot right there. Going to have to clear a little bit of that branch out, but that's not a big deal. Now there's another spot. We got to trim a couple of those branches down out, but I've got that shot there. Got a shot over into here. Now, if you notice, I'm just swinging around to the back side of a tree. You know, a lot of the YouTube dudes, they'd be standing on their platform 18 inches away from the tree, spinning around 180 degrees to take that shot over there. The proper way to do it, whether I'm shooting there or whatever, is just to slide off to the side. So you got a strong shot. You always want to take a strong shot and you don't want to make all that body movements when your body's on the same side of the tree as the deer. You'll, you'll get picked in a heavily pressured area. In pressured areas, deer look in trees for danger. Slowly scan all that brush and stuff. Okay, I'm up in that red oak that uh, I prepped last, last summer. When I'm hunting, I kind of like to have my seat shallow. It's well, my waistline is way up here, and the top of my seat is way down here. You can't do that with any single panel saddle. They're gonna ride up into here no matter what. Every, every single panel saddle comes up to your waist. So with this two panel saddle, an ESS, you can just have it cradling the bottom of your butt. That way you have all this upper body mobility to spin and shoot behind you. Your waist is totally free. It's easy to change your clothes. There's just a lot more things you can do. So if you're a new user and you buy an ESS, you know, once you get up here and you hook up, like I'm hooked up right now, you might wanna just take your index finger, slide it underneath the top strap of the outer panel. The outer panel is one with the lineman loops. And you may want to pull it up here. You may want to have your seat a little bit deeper. You may want it up into your lower back a little bit or up at your waist. So you can make that seat as wide, as, as deep as you want. Because as a new user, that'll make you feel more secure. Like you're not going to fall. <laughs> you're not going to fall out of it no matter what you do, but it'll make you feel more, more comfortable and secure. And then as you get more accustomed to using a saddle and hunting from a saddle, what you'll find yourself doing is bringing those panels back down. I personally like to have about a nine inch. So I, I slightly overlap them. Uh, and again, gives you lots of upper body mobility. Uh, another cool thing about the ESS, and a lot of people don't like it because it's metal you know, they think these two metal D-rings are gonna click each other, which is absolutely ridiculous to think such a thing. Your bridge slides on those D-rings. So anytime you're in a single panel saddle, first off, they tend to climb up your back. And when they do, you have to lift your weight up and pull it back under your butt. You do it about every five to 10 minutes. With this one, your inner panel, this panel stays under your butt all the time. 100% of the time and because these panels work separately what this upper panel does outer panel does does not affect the inner panel that always stays under your butt you never have to lift up and pull it back under your butt it stays there all the time so you can change the seat depths for changing your clothes comfort you know if I get in this saddle an hour and a half before daylight I'll pull this up here and I'll basically do this and I'll fall asleep I'll put my knees into the tree and I'll fall asleep, but I've got back support. Then once I get up, it starts cracking daylight, I'll pull it back down. And it's real easy. And a lot, of, a lot of these saddle companies with two panels, all of them actually, they're making their saddle panels covered with mesh, which is absolutely ridiculous. It looks cosmetically attractive. I don't care about cosmetics. I'm trying to kill stuff. That's what saddle hunting is all about. 
Having mesh on the exterior of your panel, what that does, instead of being able to take your finger and slide it underneath the top strap of your outer panel and lift up, you have to physically reach down and grab with your thumb and your index finger, you have to grab it and pinch it to pull it up. And it's not easy to do when your clothes are tight. So with an ESS, the strap is exposed. You just stick your index finger underneath the outer strap and just lift up. There's a purpose for everything on here. Uh, the first one we did had mesh on it. I absolutely hated fabric on the exterior of these two panels because it made it just more difficult to maneuver and move. And when you wanna move stuff a lot of times during a hunt, it's during a kill period. It's when you're moving into position for a kill. And I don't wanna have to fidget and make two extra seconds to pinch something and move it as opposed to just reaching my finger underneath it, sliding it up, or taking my thumb, if I wanna bring it down, I take my thumb and put it over top of the bottom strap of the outer panel and pull it down. It's just really, really much, much easier. So the D-rings allow the bridge to move, so it automatically, whenever you do move the, adjust the panels, it automatically moves to the position on your D-rings to self-center your weight distribution. That's a big, big deal, because anytime you have a fabric or a rope bridge, which all saddles do, if you have fabric bridge loops, as soon as you put your weight into it, like I'm doing right now, it kind of binds fabric on fabric. So it doesn't move unless you manually, if you adjust your seat or anything, you have to manually move those to keep that saddle tucked underneath your butt. With this one, it automatically does all of that. First off, it stays under your butt anyway, but it still automatically, you automatically redistribute your weight evenly. Uh, also it has an adjustable bridge. Usually once you get the bridge length you want, mine's 16 inches from D-ring to D-ring. You never move it again. It stays in that set position. Uh, most hunters like it maybe 18 to 20 inches, but I'm a 16 inch guy. And another thing I wanna really <laughs> stress, when you buy an ESS in a kit, your carabiner on your tree tether rope, which is this one right here, is gonna be hooked to a Prusik knot. Now that Prusik knot, just like your fabric bridge or your rope bridge to your bridge strap, as soon as you put weight in it, because you got a rope on a rope, as soon as you put your weight in it, it binds to the rope. That Prusik knot binds to the rope. It does the exact same thing as a bridge strap does on a fabric bridge loop. So to move or adjust your Prusik knot, you have to, basically fidget with it for a little bit, three or three seconds to loosen it up because it's tightened up around that rope. And you gotta loosen it up to slide it up or down. With this rope, man, it's really easy. Now these are cam locks. So this came from the rock climbing industry. It's real easy, you just grab your tree tether above the rope man, between the tree and your rope man. You just pull your weight up a little bit. If you wanna let some out, you let it out. If you wanna pull some up, just pull some up so you can adjust how you sit just like that. Takes less than a second. Again, or real, real quick and really, really easy. So I strongly suggest uh, getting a rope man for at least, at least for your tree tether. On your lineman rope, you don't really need it because you got time to fidget around. But when you're in a hunting situation and you want to adjust you know, having that quick adjust one way or the other is nice. And uh, usually you're doing that when you need, to, like if I'm gonna shoot at a deer over here, let's say to my one or two o'clock, you know, I'm not a platform guy. I'm not, I hunt in a pressured state uh, where deer look at hunters and trees and if there's any movement, they're gonna pick you. So, you know, you can't, you wouldn't be able to get away with it very often where you stand on a platform and spin your body around 180 degrees to take that shot over there. You're staying on the same side of the tree. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move around the tree and take that shot, you know, over here on the side. So a lot of guys, you know, they're standing on a platform, which I totally don't understand. You know, they're usually standing, so their knees are usually straight. and Typically when I'm hunting, 
my knees are going to be somewhat into the tree and my legs are somewhat straddling. When you're standing like this, that's really not, the saddle is designed to be comfortable. You know, I get people saying I've got problems with my feet hurting all the time. Well, it's because you're putting all your weight on your feet. You're in a saddle. It's got a seat. Put your weight in your butt. Let a little bit of lead out and carry most of your weight in your butt like you're sitting in a chair. Maybe you have your knees not bent quite that much, maybe 45 degrees. So your weight's in your butt. Then your feet won't get sore. So that, that's, you know, the saddle has so many different things you can do, but I watch most of these YouTube guys and they don't know how to do that stuff. Everybody hunts in the exact same manner. Everybody's, whatever, I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> but anyway, I've been hunting out of this thing for 40 some years and uh, I feel like I know how to use a saddle more so than a lot of the YouTube guys I see that haven't killed much out of it, but that's another story. Thank you for watching another episode of Eberhardt Outdoors, and if you liked it, please hit like and subscribe. Thank you.